Welcome to the Ultimate Podcast Experience with conversations about politics, religion, finances, and the meaning of life, and all the other subjects and stories that Nana told you not to bring to the kitchen table, and a whole lot more. Join our hosts, James the Red, you'll be back. And Sam, the slippery smooth producer, as they settle the ultimate question, have y'all heard about this? No, Mom, I wouldn't use the Fisher's Space Bin. No! Wow, I take. Sam, I had a blister the size of a Christmas wreath. I, I actually really like that. That's good. Your wife said that. Yeah, it was, okay, it's my wife. <laughs> hey, kids may be listening to this podcast. I feel like everything I say just sounds so stupid. Read your Bible, Sam. If you grew up eating bugs, you'd probably be fine with it. Pardon me while I go eat some soup. <laughs> Paralysis by analysis. I shut up, kid. You didn't even know what you're talking about. I'm in calculus. And we're rolling. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Not so sunny. Chattanooga today. We had a little bit of a um, last week just but what a full spring. Is that what we would call it? Yeah, I think we actually have about 12 seasons in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, and so we got hit with the, we are going to tease you and make you think it's spring. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of my favorite things to say is I wish that I had the optimism of a buttercup. Because the moment they feel the sun, they're like, hey. I heard someone else talking about this the other day. Just that grit, that go get them attitude. It's like, yeah, yeah I'm going to come on up. And then you're just wiped out. Right. <laughs> Trees have been in bloom. Uh, uh, if you live in Chattanooga, you also know that that brings with it a lot of pollen. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of cold today, a little cloudy out. I think it's like 90% chance of rain. So I'm glad we're in a good, warm basement. An like, undisclosed location, a bunker. Yep. Dick Cheney's in the room right next to us. <laughs> oh, gosh. With, with his uh, over-under shotgun. <laughs> hey, so we, um, right we want to give out. a shout-out this morning to our friends over at Dunkin' Donuts on Signal Mountain Road for hooking us up for with some uh, tasty donuts this morning. And um, really appreciate them and their quality and fast service each day. They're not actually called Dunkin' Donuts anymore. I don't know Dunkin'. Dunkin'. Yeah, it's just Dunkin'. Dunkin'. That Dunkin', Dunkin is good. It's that a complete one, rebranding. And I got a shout-out Hickson and Pike. That's generally the Dunkin' I go yep. to. Really cool people. They greet me by name every single time. So, all right, guys. So, we've been told that when we just ramble on, that nobody wants to hear that. So, we're going to get right into some of our uh, subject matter today. Your wife said that. Yeah, it was, that's okay. It's it my wife. <laughs> um, uh, I want to tell you guys a really cool story. I know you'll have some points to talk about yourself today, but I, I read this and I just absolutely loved the, the thinking behind this and maybe even the moral of the story that goes behind this. So during World War II, fighter planes would come back from battle with bullet holes, just riddled in bullet holes. And Mm. so what the Allies would do, and that's a, that's a, I'll pause right there before I finish this story. If you've ever read the book, um, Unbroken, Mm. you know, our planes that we were sending up were kind of mass produced very, very quickly. Right. And we actually lost more to crashes and mechanical failure than were shot down. Right. So if you were a fighter pilot and you flew a plane in World War II, like, you were about as tough as, sure. as it is. It That's was. how Louis Zamperini's plane actually crashed into the Pacific. Yep. It just broke down. Right. That's like, right. <laughs> over That's the right. Pacific. So uh, the ones, so here's the thing. So it says they were they come back riddled with these bullet holes. So the Allies found the areas that were most commonly hit. So I've got a picture here, but I, nobody can see that. But just imagine out on the, the end of the wings and down toward the tail, they're just bullet, po- bullet holes everywhere. And so what the Allies did is they sought to strengthen these most commonly damaged parts of the plane. They're like, hey, that's where it's getting hit. And so we're going to reduce the number of planes that get shot down because we're going to reinforce all this metal. Well, a mathematician named Abraham Wald pointed out that perhaps there was another way to look at the data. Perhaps the reason that certain areas of the plane weren't covered in bullet holes was that planes that were shot in these areas did not return. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> So this insight led the armor oh uh, to being reinforced on the parts of the plane where there were no bullet holes. And the story behind this is arguably more important than the data itself. Um, or more precisely, it could be the reason behind why we are missing certain pieces of data that may be more meaningful than what we can actually see. Man, I'm always talking about this, like data collection and data interpretation, and that's awesome. Paralysis by analysis. Paralysis by analysis. But I, I, you know, I, it was funny because I started reading that story in the, in the pictures there and I'm looking at it and I'm like totally buying into what a great discovery. And they were about to do really the exact opposite of what they needed to do yeah. to, to save some of these planes. 
Well, I love the story. Um, <clears throat> I think we've talked about this before. Stephen Ambrose and his um, in his book Citizen Soldier. I don't know if you guys ever read that, but it was you know talking about these guys having to constantly fix things. You know, like those planes and. You know, he said one of the reasons the Allies won the war is because you had a lot of American country boys that came off the farms, you know, in Tennessee. My granddad was one of them, you know, off a farm not too far from here, up in Dallas Bay, Tennessee, just, uh, you know, poor country farmers. But, you know, they had grit and ingenuity that, you know, the Germans, um, you know, and the Italians, you know, just hadn't seen before. It was this, this ingenuity to go in and fix what's broken. We'll make do with what we have. Um, in fact, Ambrose made, made, made the point that if, um, you know, if there was a, you know, a German division driving panzers and th- these tanks, these panzer tanks, and they started breaking down, they just left them. They would yeah. get out of them and leave, and they'd get, get picked up by another transport and move on. He said, our, our boys just said, whatever it takes, we'll fix it. And so they went and found parts. They went and made stuff. I mean, they MacGyvered. Remember MacGyver, the right. TV show? Oh, yeah. They made do with what they had, and... You know, that, that kind of grit and determination, you know, helped them win the war. So, Do you, do you think our modern tanks are still <clears throat> that mechanical so that they could be fixed? In, in, I don't know. I, or do they have, like, microchips? I'm sure and, that they're very— uh, iPad screens, like— <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's probably a lot of information technology. I don't know. The military is normally running off stuff. I mean, they're updating some things, but they're normally running off stuff made in the 80s and 90s. Like, yeah. I don't know. So that's probably a good thing. Part of I me, mean, ta- part of me, takes comfort in the fact that the uh, government actually is a, a couple steps behind the citizens. I don't know, but th- maybe that sounds weird. So but. You, you guys have seen the um, the uh, inside of the spaceship that uh, Elon Musk is sending up, and that you know that you look and they don't look like the astronauts that we think astronauts look like. They're dressed differently. There are no controls. You know, there's like an iPad screen in there. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> is that something? Play Angry Birds on the way down or? It's, um, but it's really amazing. You how, get up there and you drop your screen and it cracks and it's like splintered all the way through. <laughs> and you're like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Still under warranty. Why didn't you put the otter box on that, you idiot? <laughs> otter box. That would, yeah, that's what they need on all that. <laughs> just the whole ship, just a big otter box, Ooh. you know, just a big case on the whole ship. We've watched a lot of the uh, stuff about the Apollo missions and I mean, golly, just the, the grit that people had to have to say, I'm going to, you know, you can fill that up with these millions of gallons of fuel and I'll sit on top of it. <laughs> you can light it and I'll trust or I'll die. And I think they're okay with that. Like most of them are really okay with yeah. it. I die doing this. This, this is work well done. But when they were coming back in, they had the heat shields on the capsule and you know, it's literally like flying off in yeah. pieces and you know, they, they land and, and they're good and they're safe. But, uh, Man, the technology even then that went into keeping someone safe when they did that was just uh, groundbreaking stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so here's a here's an interesting thing that I want to talk about. We talk you know, we're talking about space. We kind of morphed quickly into like you know space shuttles, and so I want to talk about the Fisher Space Pen for a second, if we can. A space pen? Yeah, a pen that's actually designed to be used in space. I've heard of this. Because, you know, so, so there's the story that um, back during this um, space race, back in the 60s, uh, we were, you know, fighting against the Russians. Of course, lockstep with them, trying to get to the moon first. And our astronauts needed some way to take notes or to, you know, maybe to check off procedures and that sort of thing. So they had to have some mechanism to do that. Well, you know, standard, you know, ink, like ballpoint inks were just gelling up and they wouldn't flow right because, you know, if you're in zero gravity you know you've got issues there with ink easy take a typewriter (laughs) 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 it is funny that you know you'd say well that's easy let's don't invest millions of billions of dollars or whatever i'm sure it was millions at the time in like coming up with a new technology for pens the soviets just brought a pencil but uh, so anyway the fisher space pen was born this this man fisher uh, devised this way to have a, a a ballpoint you know cartridge inside a pen that was pressurized with this gas that constantly forced, you know, the ink to go into the, um, you, know, you know, come out and you can actually write with it. Um, you can also write underwater with it or upside down. So, uh, so after, you know, fast forward 70 years, what that's morphed into is a bunch of, you know, middle-aged dudes sitting in desks, geeking out over their pens that can write <laughs> underwater or and I, and in I space, can't, and I can't neither of which you, they ever go to. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't tell you how many times I've needed an underwater upside down pen. <laughs> right. But that's what it is, is the stuff that you don't need but, you know, you're in that position. <laughs> you have it. You've got it. I've got a lot of that kind of stuff. <laughs> what kind of pen do you use? 
This actually is a cross pin. Um, so by the way, um, if, if it's a, can we have an intervention this morning? Like I really, sure. I really could use some help. Uh -oh. uh, I've got a problem and uh, I am completely, and I'm getting better, but I have for a very long time, Tara can attest to this. My wife can say, yeah, it's been a problem. But since I've, the time I've been in about middle school, so what would that put me? 12, 50, 13? 60 years ago. Oh, well, <laughs> that wasn't what I was going for, you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and by the way, um, it was called junior high at the time, Sam. You probably don't even realize that. Did you go to a junior high or a middle school, Yule? Middle school. It was called middle school? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I went we to were just a little more backwards. What was called a here. home school. So it was all just a... It was always it was elementary a school. <laughs> it was all elementary. Wait, what is a home school? Home school. You, the government didn't educate you? No. How is that? My mother. Is that possible? My sweet mother. She was an agent of the government. <laughs> was an agent <laughs> she, of the government. A Russian. Was a Russian spy. <laughs> You use this pencil. She, no, mom, I want to use the Fisher Space Pen. Shout, no. Shout out to my mom. She almost started like a private investigating business because she is so stinking good at like just finding out stuff like about people. Like finding where you've been. And yeah, it's, doing. Uh, she would have been good at it too. I think she, should, I think she still should. So shout Maybe out to she my mom. is and you don't know. You know, that, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable now. I mean, if I were going to do that, I wouldn't tell you that I was a private investigator. That is true. We actually both work for your mom. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the it was entire all <laughs> purpose of this podcast is to get down to those deep, deep, dark places that she just couldn't penetrate when she was homeschooling you. Oh, my goodness. So, all right. So, so here I am. I'm in junior high school, and I just somehow developed this deep, deep love and fascination with ink pens. Okay. Which is actually really geeky and stupid if you think about it. But for whatever reason, I've lived my entire life loving ink pens. Okay, so I'm, I'm similarly, I don't want to say addicted. I don't need an intervention. But I will say that the pen is a real like, um, predictor of the quality of my work, the quality of my notes, really? the quality of my handwriting. Um, so if you give me like a ballpoint pen, like the kind that you would have at the bank, you know, it's just like everybody can right. get the cheapest pen. You can get probably a big ballpoint. If I were to like take notes of that, I don't even know if I can read my own handwriting, but if you give me a felt tip pen, oh gosh, where you can kind of feel it just go across mm -hmm. the paper and there's this friction happening, like I will just slow down. Like if I were ever going to write a novel. And I may do that next, right? We're doing a podcast. The sky's the limit at this point. The sky's the limit. Um, <laughs> you know, I would. I think that's how I would. I wouldn't. I would never type a novel. Like I, I just would point. rather just sit down and write it with with one of those pens. So, what do you? What are your preferences? Do you like the? Well, I've run the whole gamut. So I'm not a big ballpoint pen uh, aficionado. Like I, I'm kind of like you. I, ballpoint pens kind of gum up. They slow me down. There's too much friction on the, on the page. But I've been um, really, really into rollerball pens and also fountain pens. Mm -hmm. And you would be surprised at the world out there that exists for fountain pens, like the community. Like mm -hmm. the, these people are obsessed and crazy about fountain pens. And so, I mean, there's like a whole, like, I don't know, in Reddit, there's this subreddit group just about pens. There are <laughs> pen shows that travel all over the country. And all they do is display pens. And people come in and they talk about pens and they spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Like I've literally spent thousands and thousands of dollars on pens. Over the course of your lifetime. Over the so course of this last year. You'll spend, life. <laughs> so that's more than you'll spend at Dave & Buster's. So this is a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, that's a lot. But, you know, you, you start getting into the history of pens. You start getting into, like, you know, manufacturers like, you know, the Japanese are like mm. huge producers of really good high quality fountain pens. They are. Uh, the Germans, of course, top notch. I've got some pens that are made uh, by a company called Mont Blanc. Maybe you've heard mm -hmm. of those. I've I mean, we're that. talking four or $500 for an ink pen. Wow. And then, you know, it goes all the way down to, you know, there's some Japanese pens that you can get that are, you know, just a few dollars, but, but, but I'll tell you guys a story. So um, we, I, I was in a, I was presenting a, a topic to a, a, um, a, a group of scouts. And these are um, Trail Life USA, young boys. Trail Life is a scouting organization. That's not, not guys that are probably going to end up playing football at Alabama. This is not what you're talking about. What, what's that? Scouts. I don't, no. <laughs> scouts? 
Like I'm scouting them out. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. These are like you know boys that are you're, they're they're just in a group to have fun and, and get trained and like how to be living the outdoors and how to grow up to be good you know godly citizens and men and. It's the better version of Boy Scouts. It sounds. It like. is. It's the more sane, rational version of the Boy Scouts. Which I'm not sure. Are they still even a thing? I mean, they are. I mean, they won't well, be. they're scouts, and now girls can be involved. So I guess okay. they're not really. All right. So so yeah. so here I am in this uh, Trail Life USA group, and it's a bunch of ten year old boys, and the topic is hobbies, and so everyone's bringing in their hobby collection, and so different boys brought in different things. Some boy brought in this this one this one young man brought in his Pez collection, which was pretty cool. You know, all <laughs> nice. these Pez containers. Just the containers, no candy. Well, I'm sure which was. is, I think, is unusual for a ten-year-old, though. I mean, Pez is kind of a. I mean, who eats Pez nowadays? I thought it was kind yeah, of. Yeah, cool. it's kind of a '90s, '80s thing. Oh my kids yeah, love 50s, Pez. '60s, '70s. I mean, it was. Uh, that's old, true. Those are years. our stocking stuffer type things. Yeah. And, yeah. So a lot of boys brought in Lego collections. Some boys brought in some re- remote control cars. I mean, stuff like that. So I brought in a collection of pins. And this one 10 year old boy, after I got through with my little spiel about pins, he looked up and he just had his nose kind of turned up. He goes, Why would you ever buy a pin? They give them away at the bank. <laughs> and I was like, Shut up, kid. You didn't even they know give what you're them talking away about. Why would you ever buy chain. a sucker, little boy? <laughs> give those away at the bank, too. Yeah, so but so I have I I probably should start giving away some pens. It really is kind of a it's a it's a drain. It's a time suck. It's a but um the first nice pen and it's weird that you remember this kind of stuff. Um, the first nice pen that was ever given to me was from a um, a teacher when I graduated high school, uh, Donna Wright. Uh, so if y'all are looking for the answers to my security questions, who is your favorite teacher? Donna Wright. <laughs> Donna Wright, great teacher, great mentor, uh, took me under her wing at a time that I really needed some direction in high school. And um, can, can I just tell that story real quick about how, how this happened? <clears throat> if it involves an ink pen, yes. It, it does in the <laughs> end, in the end. Um, so when I was in high school, I, I was really um, trying to find my way and I was not doing well at it. I was, I was pretty smart. I you found a grades. way, but it wasn't the way. I was pretty smart, made good grades, but I had had this friend group that was not going to get me very far. And, but I was trying to like live both lives. You know, I wanted this rough and rowdy friend group, but then also wanted to make good grades and, you know, yeah. have a happy home life and all these good things. And, um, so at a, and I don't even know if my parents know this, but I was like potentially going down a bad road with some people, you know, mm. and, um, I had run for some office, you know, in eighth grade. And I think I won it. Like maybe I was the treasurer. I don't even think they ever gave me a nickel <laughs> to, to manage. Yeah. This is the perfect role for someone who doesn't really know which direction he's going to R- take right. in life. <laughs> I guess yeah, right, sure. Sure. <laughs> maybe that's why they didn't give me any money. So like, I think it was like ninth grade. Um, I ran again and I'm thinking incumbents always win. Right. And, and you make your posters and put them up, but now it's high school. And so like, it's just, you know, very clickish in high school. So I was beat out by who, who to this day is a really good friend of mine. But then I just despised her because she was a cheerleader named Tanya Crittenden, Tanya Crittenden, shout out to Tanya. Um, st- uh, still a friend to this day, class of 1993 is very close from Dashville High School, but Tanya beat me as treasurer. I'm like, I'm in calculus. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm really good at math, and One Tanya's making C's. Stuff. She's like, yeah, but you're an idiot, you know, and you're also crying. drinking all of our funds up on the weekends. <laughs> she's, she's crying in algebra, pre-algebra, you know, like... Um, and so it really was like it just kind of disheartened me and all this stuff. And so the next year I said, well, I'm going to run for student council. And student council was like a step above. I mean, this is like the whole high school's government, right? This right. is not the state. This is the feds, you know. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to tell you where to spend the money that's now. Right, How about that's that? That's right. And, um, and I didn't get elected to student council. So I'm basically just going to go. I'm starting to see where a lot of Yule's bitterness and politics comes from. It all comes from ninth grade. So Donna Wright calls me that summer, and she said, hey, we've had a situation to where two student council members have gone to a conference and broken some rules, and we would like to see if if you would accept a position if I appoint you to student council. And I said, well, of course, I would love that. That's what I want to do. So I get on student council without ever anyone casting a vote. Okay, then the 
current um, vice president of student council tells me, next year, why don't you run for vice president? And I was like, okay. So I run for VP. Guess what? (laughs) Nobody runs against me because nobody (laughs) wanted the responsibility as a junior in high school. So then when it was my senior year, I run for president unopposed. And so, like, now I've got this stellar political career with like a Cuban dictator. I was just going to say, this vote. sounds he's like the start of. He's like, up there with a jumpsuit and a cigar. <laughs> but, he's like, you will do what I tell you. Tyrannical but being government. more involved in that peer group and with that teacher. And she really encouraged me to go to a lot of conferences. So I was surrounded by leadership from other schools and, and regions. I went to nationals, went out to Denver, um, won student council member of the year, and won a scholarship my senior year turned my life around that one phone call that she said hey you well i think it wasn't the the phone call was the beginning but but being able to have a teacher like that that saw something in you to say this this person could lead or be in a leadership position and be trusted with that and i really did take that all very seriously but she gave me as a graduation gift a cross pen really that i have to this day can i can i rock your world a little bit so so miss wright really wasn't who you thought she was. So, <laughs> so I think the story really is that she was a CIA plant. It was a psych op. She actually derailed the careers of those other two council members yep. just to put you in office so you could be her puppet. And then my mom Welcome was to politics, people. the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and all those campaign funds, she just siphoned into that cross pen for my graduation. Do, yeah. you, do you want me to make you feel real old, Yule? I don't know. That you He's could. like, I don't know what a cross pin is. <laughs> no, 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 no. You were saying that, uh, wh- who was it that graduated in 93? Class of 93, me. You? I did too. That's the same year. Well, I, I, I almost graduated in 93. But. So <laughs> that's that a different my, story. That was my birth year. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'd made so many poor decisions. I've got a question. <laughs> what kind of man ever uses the phrase birth year? That was my birth year. That, that is the year. Pardon me birth. while I go eat some soup. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so uh, listen, we, we, let's, let's, um, I, I don't so know funny. the reason. <laughs> Why nec- is that so funny? I don't Sorry. know the reason necessarily for the names that Sam has uh, titled us with in our intro. Um, no reason. My name is Yule. <laughs> uh, we're here with James. And Sam, Sam is our producer and our uh, just electronics extraordinaire. We couldn't do this without (laughs) him. James and I would be recording into a cassette tape and trying to fi- find like this MP3 converter. Oh my uh, God. It would be like, Sam. I'm speaking softly so Mrs. Wright won't hear me. But I want you all to know that Sam is, is if, if you hear some um, references to this, Sam is a vegan. So well, we had a. Like, not okay. really. I mean, you, you've already converted. Oh, wow. We have, we have yeah. worked on him fast. No, 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 no. We. So this is going <laughs> to. I feel like everything I say just sounds so stupid. Uh, so. Technically, I would be an ovatarian, and that means that you, that's where the birth year came from. <laughs> <There's some> o- <laughs> that's not an astrological sign. It is. I eat eggs. Hey, kids may be listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, I know that sounds. Do you sounds drink weird. milk? No, but you eat eggs. Yeah. Oh, can I tell you my, my favorite That's it. jokes? So it's pretty much eggs and vegetables for About me. the guy, guy that goes to the fancy French restaurant, and he can't pronounce you know, what it says because it's in French, and he said, what is that? And they said, well, that's for breakfast. You can have beef tongue. He goes, well, I'm not going to eat anything that comes out of an animal's, animal's mouth. Just give me some eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you eat eggs and carrot juice. Yep, that's it. And, Just that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he runs around the house doing jazzer size. So the real, I mean, this is hey, we can have a you know we can have an intervention right here. So the real reason I changed up my diet um, is because I have some of the worst flatulence in the world. You can go ahead and say it. Your wife told you to. Yeah. Well, no, no. Is that like, a byproduct of veganism? I actually did it first. No, 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 no. It was before. It was before. Like I used to have to go and like lay down on the couch <laughs> after I'd eat dinner because I was so bloated and just. Struggling. <laughs> so, for, so for anyone, Sam, born before 1993, we know just to let that stuff out. <laughs> like we don't lay down on the bed. No, no. So, so that's the thing. 
So let me have. I don't, don't want to go in. <laughs> so so, so why don't I change my diet so that beans is the the, the, the major bean. protein source in my diet? <laughs> that makes so much sense. No, I have noticed a huge improvement in my digestion. Because I mean, uh, what you know, were you eating? Lover, lover, hate meat. It is tough on your colon. So uh, it, it is like I mean, especially red that. meat. Like so yeah. the 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 numbers of or like the stats when people go on like a vegetarian or a vegan diet. Um, the stats of colon cancer just like they drop. Yeah, I, so. you're probably uh, not probably. I think that has been um, well, well studied, and and it's kind of crazy that it's been so well studied yet we still eat so bad. Well, and I don't believe yeah, I don't I, believe that you like can't have a healthy diet with meat. Like that's not I'm, I don't believe that. I, I just it's just my choice personally, but um, I definitely think there's certain things like you were saying, like you know. Red meat, the, bacon, a, those aren't good huge, for you. <laughs> there's a book published, of a huge long-term study about, uh, you know, they compared the sad American diet, st- standard American diet, um, which is, you know, the food pyramid and where you're supposed to have this much dairy and this much grain. This a government much conspiracy. Yeah, pr- pretty fine. much. It is, it is absolutely the pyramid's upside down, if not altogether right. wrong. Um, I follow no food plan. Anyway, so so I'm not preaching to anyone, but... But they actually did a long-term study against a, a, a group of people who were meatless. And, I mean, the, the, it, it wasn't even this statistical significantly difference. It was aboundingly different yeah. of the rates of heart disease, colon cancer, other cancers, all these things. And, um, but it, as I heard a comedian once say, you know, the years that they're talking about are the ones at the end. You know, if you, if yeah. you <laughs> so it's not like you got to right. make any difference today. Right. They're just going to get the bad years anyway. Well, so. It's crazy because um, in my research about like vegan, vegetarian, stuff like that. So eating meat has a pretty acute effect on your health right when you eat it. And but same, the kind of cool flip side of that is pretty much any time you make that change, a lot of the damage can kind of be undone. Like there's people who have gotten over like stage four. One of my favorite shout out to Chris beat cancer.com guy had stage four or whatever the last stage colon cancer. And, he, and they like told him you're, you're not going to live. And he was like, yeah, I am. And he ate like speaking about juicing carrots. He juiced like some ridiculous amount of carrots per day, ate like whole garlic cloves. And he got, he, he cured himself from stage four cancer yeah. with just diet. I, I was I was not going to get into this um, today, but apparently Let's this is a good um, segue to do this. So I have talked about diet, and I joke about it because I am I am either one way or the other. I'm either eating donuts and candy, <laughs> cake, dessert, popsicles, Jolly Ranchers. You know, we've discussed that. Yeah, I, those but are if, my weakness. But <laughs> and I and what I'll do is I'll fluctuate my weight to an unacceptable level. Um, to where one, it's a tightening of the clothes. I don't like the way I look in pictures. Mm-hmm. And then finally, you know, you just feel like overall crud a lot. And then I'll make my mind up, you know, that I'm going to, I'm going to really eat healthy. I'm going to do it right. So yesterday I drank, I did have a breakfast sandwich, but it was like a bagel, bacon, egg and cheese <clears throat> from Duncan. Our friends over at Duncan on Signal Mountain Road. If y'all hear this, <laughs> you want to plug this they're killer they're killer no they're awesome um i I had a really busy day i drank a lot of water and and i i didn't have time to go eat lunch so i i literally with a spoon ate a half of a um container of hummus that's it and then i went home and jill had some leftover pasta i ate a very small portion of pasta and that was it for yesterday and compared to some of the days before it's just eat 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 because yeah. you're bored eat because it's there and i think you know when we'll get into the whole um abundance of meat is probably what drives a lot of that yeah. but uh, here's what i'm bringing this up so i am getting back close to my max weight and something went you know like i had the the switch flip a little bit for me this uh, kind of over the weekend coming back home from a trip i said all right i'm about to <laughs> get back on the wagon right i'm going to start eating good so um i'm not going to tell you what i weigh but I'm about to go on a weight loss and fitness journey, and I can't do that without bragging about it. Hey, it's okay. That's okay. Like if I run, it's on Facebook. It's why, on Facebook. Why would you run? Is somebody going to be chasing you? Like I don't understand why you would just to run. accelerate the weight loss. Why don't you just eat better and then just go walk? Yeah, I'm not that patient. I mean, I think at your age, eating is definitely at your age. You probably don't want to be running. The most important thing, because I think a lot of people will like forget that that's thing you do three times a day. So if you can change that behavior. 
that's I've not run yet. Fun. I mean, yeah. like, I ha- and and again, I've gone through spouts of you know, bouts, spouts. I've spouts, gone through spouts. periods to where I would spouts. run, and then I'll, you know, I'll run for months and like be very committed, de- and then I'll get derailed in some way, and and I stop posting about it. They're like, huh? I wonder what happened to Yule's training plan. Hmm. I mean, it would seem natural <laughs> to run in a short burst for I don't know, say three hundred yards if you had to, because someone's chasing you or something, you know, some animal or whatever. That seems natural. But to just slowly run for seven miles? Actually, our bodies are designed 20. for that. Why would you do that? Our actual seven bodies miles? are designed for that. For so what? it's like long distance running. We're one of the only creatures that can do that. That doesn't mean um, we should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a long distance runner. We so can also go to space. <laughs> hey, that's true. That's true. We can go to space. Allegedly. Allegedly. I'm just so, wait, so are, are we I, gonna, can, can we get into the moon landing? Let's do it's it. Let's this do is, it. This is not <laughs> a fitness podcast. podcast. The moon landing this is, is not a fitness kids. podcast, but if I start seeing some results, I'm sorry, you will probably hear about it a lot. Okay, as, lo- as long as we can see the results. And like, you're a pretty, pretty good looking clear. guy. Like, he's, starting, he's starting from a pretty nice slate, you know? Okay, imagine George <laughs> Clooney grew up in the backwoods of Alabama. Yeah, actually, that is that is true. Yeah, and never mm-hmm. actually made it famous and never that ran. That may be the nicest thing anyone's ever said about <laughs> yeah. me. I, I actually really like that. That's good. George Clooney. George man. Clooney. That's the best comparison I've ever had. So you mentioned my age. I always am guessed at being older than I am. I'm 46. And most people think I'm in my 50s or mid-50s. I've, I've had even higher than that. And so, People um, guessing that you're older? Oh, yeah. yeah I thought older. you were like almost 60. Way older. Seriously. They, they guess it all the time. So people always think I'm much older than I am. I've got a group of friends. I'm the youngest, and we've gone to restaurants, and I'm like, hey, rank us. And they're all, they always rank, the waitress always ranks me as the oldest. Interestingly, the guy who's the oldest, she always ranks him as the youngest, and then the middle two, they either get right or transverse. But I'm always the oldest consistently. So, well, I'll tell you two things that happened. One, I was with Jill's dad one time who is – 80, this year, he will be 83 years old. And we went to a restaurant one time, and like, without prompting, the waitress said, are y'all brothers? What? <laughs> is it the yeah. gray hair? Is that what it is? It's is not it the gray hair? gray. It's not white. No, it's so, full on gray. Your I mean, it's full on gray, gray but okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's no pigment coming back in your hair, dude. All right, so, so to put that in perspective, Jill's dad was born in 1939. Okay, so <laughs> I was born in 75. And I'll say, yeah, you know, mom had him and waited like 40 years and then had me. <laughs> had a little late, late in life yeah. fling. You might know her name is Sarah. Um, but then. <laughs> I didn't get that the reference. The matriarch. Uh, wife okay. of Abraham. Oh, yeah, hey. You know, they, they yeah, were having babies. I just read my Bible. Read your Bible, Sam. <laughs> they had babies when they were 90 something. Um, so we go to the beach and we park at, um, y'all have been to Seaside, you know where that is? So Seaside now has this new scam to where you, they used to have all this parking everywhere. Now they have parking and people walk up to you and get paid and they'll, you have to pay them for it. Like in their yard, you just park and in their, not, park not in their, their yard, but it's back in the, like their community. It used to just be parking and now it's like paid parking. But anyway, um, we, we pull up, I have no idea why this person thinks I'm somebody that I'm not. Like, you know, we're in like a 2014 Honda Pilot. We're not rolling in in, in a Mercedes, <laughs> you know, or a Rolls Royce. And the guy goes, no, it's a girl. She goes, are you an actor? And I said, well, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you was like. <laughs> and she goes, I know who you are. You're that guy. You're that guy from Miss Congeniality. She thought I was Michael Caine. Shit. Michael Caine. No way. Michael what? Caine. Dude, that was, guy is older is, than he's dirt. He's 88 right now. years old. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, Do, did you just think you oh, didn't I just age went with it. I think I may have even signed an autograph. Can I just say something really sad for my, Michael Caine has been in a boatload of really good movies. <laughs> and so the really sad part for me is that what he gets remembered for. Is Miss Congeniality? I, I call him that up is, for that one. What in the world? He's been in Batman. What? He's been in all oh, those yeah, amazing yeah. ones. Yep. That guy in in in, in that uh, uh, that Sandra Bullock movie. Uh, that guy. <laughs> no, you're right. That's like probably his weakest work oh, in this man. whole career. <laughs> okay, oh, how man. did we? Where, where are we? Like, what? Where have we? How have we gotten here? How did we what, get what here? What were we talking about? I don't know. Nothing. We were talking about... Remember, we said this podcast would not be for you. All right. We all really haven't helped me at all with my pen addiction, but I think I'm going to be okay. 
No, 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 no. Um, I'll help you very simply. You. I would love one of those expensive pens. If you give it to me <laughs> in 20 years, I'll be... You know me. Podcast. That's what you I should do, you. James. You should give them out as like Christmas no, presents. No, listen. You don't even you understand. Know? At one point, I actually brought uh, like an entire tray of really high-end pens to church here and left them on the, in the foyer, and people started taking them. The kids. Oddly enough, I don't ever see people riding with them. Not that I'm bitter or angry about that or anything. <laughs> Bring me one, and I'll... I'll They're like I'll, taking them, and James is like... Give me that back. It's like it's like you're not treating it's like that my door. daughter or something, and she's like, "Oh, pen," and you're like, "No, that's not for a coloring no. book." <laughs> so you um, can't even afford the cartridge for that pen, kid. <laughs> well, I gotta tell a story about. So we, uh, I, I had to go on a, a, a trip for work. I work for the federal government. If if anybody here didn't know, um, and so Hot take the federal bi the f- <laughs> the federal bureau of something. Um, anyway, it's an alphabet agency uh, within the deep state. And we had to take a trip to Washington, D.C. Uh, and so, you know, all my, I was traveling with a couple guys and, you know, they wanted to go out and do the things you'd want to do after work in Washington, D.C. We wanted to go see a Nationals game and go see some, you know, museums. And I said, guys, we've got to go to Farney's Pen Shop. This is one of the most <laughs> premier pen shops in the world. And they were like, but we have pins. <laughs> they're like, they're in our bag. We got them out of the supply call closet at the pins. office. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't understand. We've got to go to far in these pins. Our agency has like a $2 million a year big budget. <laughs> <laughs> so we go in there and I buy this pin and I bought a cross, a uh, cross mm-hmm. Townsend rollerball pin. Uh, it was about, I don't know, it was like a hundred bucks. And so I buy the pen, and I actually see um, another guy from the same agency we work at who was also there unexpectedly. And he was like, looked at me, and he's like, oh, hey. And it was almost like we had this kind of like shocked, embarrassed, shameful look on our faces like, we got caught at the pen store together. <laughs> but uh, that guy, you probably should know by now, but that guy worked for Sam's mother. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Wright and Mrs. Cream Cheese, they formed an agency. Yeah, they were. <laughs> the deep state. Watching deep what state. you were doing. The deep state. They, they knew you'd figure out how to, you were in there like, hey, which of these pins can you turn into a gun? <laughs> okay, so, so, so I, I get this pin. It's like a hundred bucks. I'm loving it. I go to this conference. I'm taking these notes. Um, of course, it writes as good as the pin that I had before, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> and so, uh, so, okay, so fast forward a Does couple months. Does it spell better? <laughs> no, it's exactly the same. <laughs> this is a problem. So a couple months later, we take a, a trip, like our whole team just does like this like team outing. One of this young kid, arranged us for us for us all to go to Huntsville, Alabama to the Space Center. So we all went there. And there's a ride there where you get in it and they strap you in and it like launches you up into space. I think it's supposed to simulate like G force or now something. Hold on. Is this is this the uh, one that turns around and around or it goes straight up? Well they were both. The, the one I'm talking about though is the one that you get in and it goes straight up. Oh. Like it's launching you out into orbit or something is what you Jeez. feel like. So so I get into this ride and I have this cross Townsend pin <laughs> attached into my shirt pocket because that's you know that's what you do with a nice pin you put it in your shirt pocket like a grandfather would do and i get launched pin up protected. with zero whatever four what i don't know four or five g's or whatever they you know whatever that is and i get launched into outer space that that <laughs> cross townsend is still floating in orbit somewhere <laughs> I thought oh, it was going to be like through your femur or something. No, it just <laughs> went like, because, you know, at some point you get to the top and you stop. Well, you know, objects in motion uh, tend to stay in motion. You remember so that from like, your yep. physics days. So, so, you know, we lived in Huntsville for quite a while. Love that town. And uh, so because my wife also works for this federal agency, and we'll never narrow this down that y'all would ever know who this is, but um, federal, <laughs> federal employees get in there um, free. Right. And so we went to the Space and Rocket Center a lot. We found that out after we bought a yearly membership one time. Um, <laughs> but anyway, when I was a kid, I would just have, I mean, like, that was the greatest thing was, would be to ride a ride like that. As an adult, I hate that thing. <laughs> like, the, the going up is not bad. When they start dropping you, it is like, I don't want to say terrifying, it's just like, not just so uncomfortable. Right. It's like, like we've been designed to run long distance, but we really shouldn't. You know what I mean? Right. Like we've been designed to be able to withstand being launched into space, but maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> Have you ever, all right, so good question. Have you ever seen anyone like, I, I know you probably have not, but maybe you've seen this on TV where someone has drank too much and they're really, really happy. You know, oh, yeah. they, they I used to really, valet. I used to see that. You know, all like people the just in a and great they would get in their mood. cars. They get like invade your personal space. Like, hey, man. But they're, you know, right? <laughs> that, you, so you would say they're they're kind of like high, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. So like highness means kind mm-hmm. of like this euphoria, 
But then people talk about a runner's high. Have you ever seen a runner after a marathon like like that? <laughs> they look like like there's uh, maybe internally they're feeling it, but on their face it's like this was the worst thing oh, I've I ever done. So my brother the, the, used to do half Ironmans, which are a mile and a half swim, fifty six mile bike, and a thirteen like it's a half marathon. So it's what is that thirteen point one thirteen point one run? And when he crossed the finish line, he was just like, oh. Oh. <laughs> well, my theory is, and you'll see this as you as you drive around town from now on. You'll see this. You go look at a runner who's running on the side of the street. They are not happy, right? Never. The, the facial the yes. facial expression is not. Yeah, they're like, this is stupid. You're, you're lying about this runner. So, I'll try to get it. But have you something. seen my outfit? You it reaches <laughs> it reaches you. So as as a long distance runner, <laughs> you'll, I just love the faces that you'll like makes at me. Um, you you get that runner's high. You from know me, something about this? About yeah, about it's about mouth four or three so if you're not like it, generally if you're running two miles you're not going to feel that so you get it it's essentially when i think i think it's when your body i don't know the science of it but it's my guess that's when your body's like kind of has to start coping with the fact that you're in pain so like your legs will kind of not feel pain anymore yeah that's what i was gonna say about so. mile two what i feel <laughs> is a shin splint <laughs> but yeah it does come later and then it kind of comes in waves so like the max mileage I got, and I'm proud of this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. A max mileage I've ever ran is 18 miles. Um, I'm training for a marathon again, so I'm trying to go more. But Dang. it is, a lot of miles, it is you alternate between like, oh, I feel great, and like, oh, this is the worst decision ever in my life. And I've heard like for marathon runners, I don't know that because I haven't done that. It's like that just hits you at different, like every other mile, when, you're just like, oh. When I get back down to 165, I'll start running with you like that. <laughs> 165. That's yeah. I mean, I, you, you can't carry this kind of weight 20 miles, dude. <laughs> like, got to lose some weight before I can run like that. I think 165. Hey, I told y'all earlier I would uh, throw Jim under the bus. Okay, right. let's do it. Let's do it. So Jim's a friend of ours, uh, businessman, uh, community leader, uh, church leader, great guy. Um, maybe he, not. He's so all much. right. He's all right. He's all right. Um, <laughs> And Jim has an office downtown, and this is years ago, uh, the first time we lived in Chattanooga. And um, Jim has an office, and he tells us that he also has a place that we can, he wants to go for a run. And oh. he, he runs like every day, like five, six, seven miles a day, every day. Have you Jim seen where his does? office is? Yeah, he's right running downtown. for his life, though, as soon as yeah, he walks yeah. out Yeah, well, you have to, yeah, it's a bad part of town. <laughs> but, um, it's, but it's, you know, it's getting better over there, I think. In 20 years, it'll be great, I'm sure. Um but we we are going for this long run with Jim, and Kenny's with us. And if you've ever been with Jim and Kenny, the one thing that you'll figure out is you don't always know what the plan is. You know why? <laughs> because they don't always know what the plan is. And But we go for probably a longer run than I'd been on. Like, I was running like two to three miles in my runs, and Jim's like, yeah, I'm probably going to go five or six. I'm like, well, what is it, five? or six, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> my body has a stop button and, um, yeah. and I, and Some I can't, of these details are important. Yeah. yeah it's it is. important to me, <clears throat> maybe not to them because Jim's like, well, I could probably run 12. So it's nothing Jeez. to him. Good for him. And so anyway, here's, I'm going to throw Jim under the bus. Jim is a man of means and Jim has a nice office and he could have his bathroom to be anything he wanted it to be. I'm sure. And he warns us there's not a lot of hot water. And if four of us are going to shower, like don't, like spend Wait, a lot of time. Fourth? Who was the fourth? Oh man, I, somebody I, in his office. I'm trying to remember who all it was. There were, there were three. I know there were three, four, maybe even five of us running that day. I'll have to go back in my journal and tell you who all the parties were. But we go back. Multiple of us are needing to shower, redress, go back to work. And Jim goes, "Look, there's not a lot of hot water." And I said, "Okay, all right. So, put yourself in my shoes. You go to a typical hotel, right? Hotel." And you turn the water on and nobody, like, you know exactly where it is at home. You know where right. the dial needs to be. But, you know, at a hotel, you're, you're just trying to figure it out. So my way of doing that is I always turn the water on full blast hot and then dial it back. Back it off. Okay. So I turn it on full blast hot. It's hot. I start dialing it back. And it gets right to the right temperature. The moment I get under the water, it goes pure cold. What the? <laughs> I turn it all the way, all the way back to hot. And it just stays, like ice cold and so that's the fastest shower i've ever taken i come out i was like jim i think something's wrong with your water heater good he said i told you there wasn't a lot of hot water i was like well By not a lot i mean zero like, <laughs> he said like it's like a three gallon tank <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm that's like, like a toilet flush. <laughs> that is the yeah. That's the last time I ever ran with Jim. And um, or at least, yeah, I, I never, I've never ran with him again, and I'm certainly never going to shower there. Well, again. I read an article once in theartofmanliness.com. Have you guys ever checked that blog out? Mm-mm. By the way, you should. It's a really, really good blog. Um, but he, um, Brett McKay, is the founder of that website and a prolific writer, author, researcher about just traditional manliness throughout history. And um, anyway, he wrote an article once about how you should be taking ice cold showers. And about the health benefits of that. I, I, I've, okay, I'm glad you bring this up because yeah. there's a friend of mine who's told me that this is a thing. And I am just can't help but feel like he's just trying to prank me. And I think so it's I'm a communist it. uh, conspiracy, <laughs> personally. Mrs. Wright and Mrs. Cream Cheese orchestrated it's like, this. It's like, it's like the whole eat bugs thing. It's, it's, the, it's the same crowd. Yeah. They're, they're wanting us to eat bugs, want us to take cold showers. But he Wait, apparently who, he does. Who wants this. us to eat bugs? I haven't heard eat this. Eat zip bugs. Um, it is. Uh, I think it's Klaus Schwab from uh, Oh the World Economic Forum. Yeah, we just got our podcast demonetized. Oh no, I'm sure. <laughs> we love you, Klaus. <laughs> we love you, Klaus. <laughs> we'll do whatever you say. <laughs> we will eat zip bugs. <laughs> if you grew up eating bugs, you'd probably be fine with it. Anyway, he calls this the James Bond shower: a shot of cold water for health and vitality. So and AFib. No, is it? <laughs> Wait, a fib or a fib? Atrial fibrillation. Oh, I thought you were saying he was lying that's about what it. Would being happen. Fine. That's what would happen to me if I turned on the cold. Here are the benefits it improves your circulation. So, that ice cold water shot actually gets your blood flow and your capillaries open up, and you actually, you know, are healthier because you've got is more that blood. that the flow. case? Because when you're cold, that's when you get pale and all your blood goes in. It seems, you know, I cold, think it cold stuff does, yeah. does constrict. So. Uh, maybe this is AFib. Uh, <laughs> it relieves depression. So if you do an ice cold shower, you won't be as depressed. It also keeps your skin healthy and shiny. And it strengthens your immunity. I could see the skin thing because I know hot water is not good for your skin. Maybe that's why I look like Michael Caine. I'm taking really hot showers. <laughs> is, was he that guy that was in Miss Congeniality? <laughs> well, it also increases your fertility. So if you need to take an ice cold shower... So that you can have... That, you know. See, that's, that can't be true. We all know. We all know. <laughs> Go take a cold shower. We've been hearing that our whole lives. <laughs> and now all of a sudden it's saying, hey... It increases our fertility. You need it. <laughs> well, it increases your... It, it, saves, it saves energy. <laughs> because you're not burning so much electricity. This is coming straight from the World Economic Forum. <laughs> there is so much raunchy material in that that I'm not going to go there today. Well, good, good. I don't think Michael are we going to go there? Are we going to have like a after hours podcast where we just like just let it rip? No, here's what we'll do: is we'll say we're going to pick up on this next podcast, and then next podcast we're going to be talking about you know hiking the Appalachian Trail. Instead. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, we need to tell our story about how we wound it up on the uh-huh. lodge at Mount Leconte in the Smoky Mountains. That's a that's a good story. You know that that may have been one of the luckiest days of our lives. I don't I see. Mean, I don't believe in luck. Day. I believe in the providence yeah, of God. The atheist. Yep, I, I, I'm with you. That was <laughs> we were we were beyond blessed that day. Amen. Considering <laughs> storm so bad that night, but we'll that's a teaser. We're not going to tell you about that till next time. It wasn't just the storm. It was the the rubber band legs. It was the mm. fact that we just had had two days of like rock scrambling and knees sh- shattered and shot and aching. Sam, I had a blister the size of a Christmas wreath. <laughs> <laughs> It was bad. This sounds like a good story. And, and this was a Kenny and Jim this story. This is a Kenny and Jim story. And um, this was this was Kenny. This was all Kenny. This was Kenny's idiocy. <laughs> wow, yeah. hot take. That that that, that kind yeah. of set and this whole true. story up. We were so. I love you, Kenny. We'll get into this story next time. But we were on the way up there and stopped at Bass Pro Shops. You remember that? Yeah. And I'd never done this before, and and I had pretty much everything I needed, but it was this counter of, you know, do, how much do you take versus how much do you want to carry? So it's the weight balance oh, and stuff. all that. And and I felt like we did a pretty good job planning that. But we get there, and I said, hey, do I need some of these hiking poles? And Kenny goes, no, you can just get your big stick in the woods and, you know, go the, just, you know, He probably didn't walk, want you like to have to spend 100 bucks on something probably, you use one time. Probably. Which is, yeah. So I said, well, Kenny, um, does Jim have sticks? <laughs> you have hiking poles, and he goes, Kenny. Yeah. You know, does James have hiking poles? Yeah. Well, do you have them? Yeah. Well, I'm getting them. So I get them, and we, I, re, I just remember on that hike, the, so we take a shortcut over to Mount, to the Leconte Lodge, and we're on this 
ledge. And if, if I'm exaggerating this, please tell me I am, because the way I remember it was there was a, a, a steep, like, wall, not a wall, mountain, straight up to our left. It was straight down to the right, and we were walking on probably a 14-inch ledge. It was covered in ice. It was covered in ice, and there was, like, no way to tie off. No, even if there was, we didn't have anything to tie with. Right. And, and I looked at Kenny, and I said, if I did this without these poles and died, I would haunt you, <laughs> and my wife would come looking for you. And, in fact, I said, if my wife even knew I was here doing what I'm doing right now, she would never let me be friends with you ever again. Well, I think if you're not doing something that's absolutely terrifying your wives, then as a man, you're doing something wrong. You know what I mean? Like, you need to be out there making your wives a little nervous every now and then. I think my wife's terrified every time I leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> the Have Y'all Heard About This podcast is produced by Play It By Ear Audio. Leave us a review, like us, rate us, or subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use. If you wish to contact us or you have a suggestion for the show, email us at hyhatpodcast at gmail.com.